Hello everybody, my name is George Popescu and I'll be today presenting a Bright Talk webinar on how to evaluate an ICO. ICO stands for, of course, for Initial Coin Offering and today I prepared about half an hour to 45 minutes of presentation, after which I will be taking questions. Um, feel free to ask the questions during the presentation and I'll be answering them at the end as well. Um, if for any reasons um, you want to contact me after the presentation, you can see here at the bottom my email address, gapopescu at gmail.com. And usually um, our organizer, Ryan, who works at Bright Talk, um, makes the PowerPoint available after the presentation. So you'll be able to download the whole, the whole PowerPoint. So a little bit more about myself to give an idea what I... Um, where my thoughts are coming from and my background, so you understand why I'm talking about this and what I know and what I don't know. I am the uh, uh, and, and I'm, I'm an entrepreneur by career. I built and sold multiple companies, about a dozen companies so far, and I'm also the editor in chief and founder of Lending Times and Blockchain Times. These are two publications. If you go to lending-times.com or blockchaintimes.io on online lending, that's that, and on blockchain. That's a, a journalist award for that. I'm also a co-founder of Luna Cap Ventures, a venture debt fund, and of BlockX Ventures, which is an investment bank in the blockchain space. We help companies organize ICOs and list on exchanges and other things like that. I'm also the CEO and founder of Lampix, uh, which is a company in augmented reality and blockchain. And we did an ICO for Lampix uh, about a year ago, and we'll talk about that as well at some point. So this gives you an idea about my background, uh, where my information is coming from, and where I spend my, my time. So today we'll have three sections in the presentation. I will talk about different blockchain companies, um, how to evaluate uh, ICOs and, and different presentations. Um, and also the mechanics of how to how to purchase the tokens if you decide to do so. Before we get into the details, I, I made a few assumptions about people listening and watching this web webinar. First, that you have you know the basics of blockchain, of blockchain technology, how it works, why it's different, and so on. I will not be explaining any of that. If you want to revi re review again or learn again or maybe get deeper into your knowledge, I strongly recommend this particular uh, presentation on YouTube. It's 22 minutes, and I find it has a good trade-off between length, detail, and so on. I also assume that you have what I refer to as risk capital. Now, um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it, it takes a lot of effort to evaluate if it makes sense to buy tokens in an ICO, to become an opportunity or not. Let's assume it takes you eight hours, 10 hours. So eight hours of work, you may be making, let's say you're making $50 an hour, you'll be making $400, versus taking eight hours to evaluate an investment in which you're gonna invest maybe $200 and you're gonna have a chance of losing them all or a chance of doubling them, may not be a good usage of your time. So think about it, is this the right thing for you? And then uh, third and last, um, I also assume that you have functional knowledge of basic investing and, and calculations. You know what the return on investment is, internal rate of return, most important the risk reward ratio, and what correlation is. If you don't, please make sure that you're familiar with these terms as well as I'll be using them. Um, now, the way I look at the ICOs, initial coin offerings, it's the same way as I, we would look at investing in any company. You know, you have to decide that you have risk capital, how much risk capital you have, and only invest just that. You have to take into account the stage of the company you're investing in. Is it early stage, later stage? We'll talk about it in a second. Also, the industry and geography makes a big difference. Um, also, how you invest, there's different ways to invest. I'll talk about that. And last but not least, the risk to reward ratio. If somebody, it's a very, very risky project, but the return is probably very, very good then you want to see, take it into account both sides. And it's, it's not really useful to just think about reward without thinking about the risk, or the risk without thinking about the, the reward. The ratio is the, the, the key. So about stage, I think that's something that's been changing a lot in the blockchain space, and I think it's very, very different. 
Uh, it's very important because the later the stage in a company, the lower the risk, but typically the lower the reward as well. Um, I've, I've been an entrepreneur, I've been an advisor at MIT mentor, uh, Venture Mentoring Services, at Techstars, different accelerators, different organizations. I've probably, I probably get one to two people who have ideas a day to reach out to me. Um, I, I, there's a, the old saying about uh, what is most important. Is it time? Is it the idea? Is it the money? Or is it the experience? And if you think about that, at least in my eyes, in my experience and so on, what's most important is time. Because money you can find, ideas are actually quite a lot of them, experience you can buy, but time you cannot make it back again. So somebody who has spent five years building something which can only be built again in five years is much more valuable than somebody who has a very good idea. So take into account uh, the stage of where the ICO is and, or, or, or the company is or whatever you're looking at. It's very, very important. Typic typically, companies who start having revenue already validated they have a working product, there's a market for them, there's a customer for them. So I personally like that very much, this particular stage where still the return is still ris reasonable, the, the reward is potentially good, but the risk is much more reasonable. Now, in terms of instruments, Traditionally, they have been debt, equity, pre-sale of product is more recent, but still not what we're talking about here today. And of course, the tokens in the initial coin offering. So that is lending money, equity is buying equity in a, in a, in a company, for example, pre-sale of products something like Kickstarter. But we're here today to talk about tokens, and we'll be focusing about that. So a little bit more about risk to reward ratio. We have to understand where the token purchasing sits in this whole ecosystem of risk to reward. And in my eyes, compared to the other uh, instruments one has access to, it's high risk, high reward. Typically, I would say ratios of 10 to 1 are high risk, high reward. So uh, out of 10, only one will succeed, but you'll make on average 10 extra money when they succeed. Of course, the game is to pick which ones you think are going to do well, and hopefully the return will be better than 10, 10, 10, uh, 10 times. So focusing more on tokens and blockchain right now, there are pretty much two types of tokens, utility or security tokens. Now, we're not here to discuss different type of uh, tokens. This is just a very simplified view. Um, but in a nutshell, utility tokens give you functionality. Uh, for example, allow you to uh, trade them for a service, for work, for stuff like that. A security token, and to be honest, they're still at the very beginning of them. They're not quite popular. Yet, in fact, there's no even a single exchange trading them. Uh, they, some of them are already circulating, but it's not the ecosystem of security tokens are not created yet. But they give you the same similar kind of rights as owning equity in a company. Typically, you'll get um, cash flow from that. You'll get voting rights. If it's traditional, you just trade decide, you know, vote on the board of directors who then elect the CEO and build the company from there. Um, if it's non-traditional, and that's what's much more interesting, it, uh, systems and organizations like the DAO, distributed autonomous organizations. I will not go into detail about how the DAO works right now, but it's pretty much a system where all the decisions in this structure called the DAO was meant to be taken by the token holders directly without any executives, without any board of directors, anything. I personally think it's a fascinating way of controlling organizations, and I think we'll see more of that being built in the future. However, it is supposed to be a security and highly regulated, which means the DAO tokens will have to trade on securities exchanges and, and, and so on. So the biggest universe right now, what's available, are the utility tokens. And you have here, a non-exhaustive description of a few I picked. Uh, of course, you're familiar with Bitcoin. I look at it as exchange of value or storage of value, Litecoin for payments, Ethereum for a distributed computer. We talked about the DAO. Um, now you have other things like uh, storage, uh, which allows to pay people for work. The same for Lampix, the, our PIX token. You have stuff like Augur, which allows you to make market and betting. You have stuff like First Blood, the company I'm also involved with, which makes a private marketplace, um, and, and many, many other ones. So 
Now the, the, the question becomes, why do I like this utility token versus other utility token? And one of the fundamental things of investing is investing in an industry that's going up. Because let's assume the industry is going to multiply by 10 in the next, whatever, three to five years. It's, it's harder to not do well in that industry than an industry that's standing still or going down. So now the question is, we're talking here about buying tokens in a blockchain company. So which blockchain companies sectors are going to do well? Well, we need to look where the blockchain companies really have an edge over the rest of the world, because that's what we're betting on. We're betting on that uh, this, let's say, in, um, in the marketplace sector, a blockchain company will do well than a company like eBay. And that's what seems to be doing pretty well. So I put here in bold three particular industry sectors that look most promising. And of course, we won't know for sure until we're in five years from now and we'll see the real advantages offered by blockchain technology to these companies versus traditional companies when they're competing head to head. Think Blockbuster versus Netflix. The internet allowed Netflix to kill Blockbuster. Same thing, will the blockchain allow companies who build marketplaces, give, will, will they give it a particular edge? They will allow it to be extremely competitive against companies who just use normal internet. Same thing in finance, because of payments, value of storage and settlement and so on, and going international. And right now, if you try to sell a product in 200 and something countries around the world, you have to deal with all the currencies and the cost of making payments. So, Every, all, all the businesses are in, international and, you know, there are some that where people sell services or images online across the world. Um, those, those seem to have in, in the interesting traction there. Now, other ones also are on this list. I'm not necessarily discounting them. I think that'll be less obvious. Um, of course, startup industry, blockchain allows to do ICOs, which allows to invest in early stage companies, which will probably compete with angels and VC investors. Um, also supply chain, where you can track where everything is in real time, um, education, you can gamify a lot of things, you can also uh, spread ownership and royalties very cheap. So it's quite a, there are quite a few industries, um, so think about it, sit back, imagine you're being approached by Netflix and imagine, okay, so will the internet, which Netflix claims is going to allow them to compete with Blockbuster, by like, like um, give them a huge advantage of a Blockbuster, will they, is it true, is it real, does it give them a real edge, does it give them really something really interesting there. So once a company decides to sell tokens, typically by initial coin offerings, this is what the timelines look like. Typically they will prepare for about four weeks, then they will execute for about 12 weeks. Now, to me, one of the most interesting parts in a, in a uh, token offering, when you decide to buy the token, is of course looking at around the industry the company is doing, but then doing a lot of due diligence on the team of the company, on their mechanics of the, the, the business, the stage of the business, talk about that. We talked about the token functionality, we'll, and we'll talk a bit more about all of this. But most importantly, you're taking a bet that the leaders of the company who will put in place the rules of how this token offering will proceed, will be able to respect their own rules. Because otherwise, they lose all credibility and they lose also the trust of whoever owns the tokens and they seem less and less likely to build a successful company. So when you see a timeline like this, be, be mindful and be worried if the company is not respecting their own rules, their own statements. Now, a little bit more about the, the market. Um, many people ask how much money is in the coin offerings, in the crypto market, and so on. Typically, one looks at an early stage token purchase as being a, div a diversification. What does it mean? It means if I have, let's say, a thousand bitcoins, and the price of bitcoin goes to one thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars, now well, I could sell some bitcoin for dollars. Or what I could do is to take a small number of those bitcoins and try to buy another token. Hopefully that one is going to go 10x in valuation. So it's typically people who own crypto try to diversify when the market goes up a lot, five to ten percent of their assets. So if the market cap right now is about 350 billion roughly, it goes up and down every few days, um, 
The amount of money that's available to invest in early tokens is about 15 billion to 35 billion. And if you look at some reports online, so far this year, it's always been in, the, in a 15 billion dollar range. So it's an active market, it's a big market, enough li liquidity, uh, there are many offerings, but also a fair amount of capital. Uh, to be very careful is that people believe that by selling their Bitcoin or Ethereum and buying these other tokens instead, they are diversifying. Well, that's why it's not quite true, because all of these tokens in ex our experience, and you can check the charts and you can Google everywhere, everything and everywhere says and shows that most of these tokens are completely correlated with the block Bitcoin price and in less measure with Ethereum, but Ethereum itself is correlated with Bitcoin. So in other words, if Bitcoin price goes up times five, your tokens will go up. Maybe not five times five, maybe times three, or maybe times 10. But if Bitcoin price goes down times five as well, so will the other tokens. So you're not really diversifying. So please keep that in mind as you purchase different tokens. The, also, the initial token market is maturing. What does that mean? It means that there are many more offerings out there. At the beginning, all of them were early stage, an idea, didn't have much to show. Now, there is a big diversity of companies trying to sell initial tokens. Companies who have an idea, all the way to companies who have tens of millions of dollars in revenue or more. And what this means is that uh, companies who are less attractive, who are less organized, who are less sophisticated, who have less things to show, they get less, uh, they don't close the sales. They don't sell all the tokens they're meant to sell. So the success rate is going up, is, is, is going down. It's an older chart. We can see how this was already happening before. Um, in June of last year, 93% of the sales were successful. In October, it was only 34%, and the latest numbers are even below that. Despite a very small percentage of token offerings being successful now, you can see how still more than $10 billion have been deployed into companies through this method. So it, it's, a, it's a big market it's, and it's growing. Now, there's a whole timing of the market. I believe there were somewhere between despondency and hope at this time already. This is a chart I had made around October, November of last year. I have not updated it since. Um, to give you an idea about the typical market cycles, panic, despondency, hope, uh, fear. So we were somewhere in, in June of last year, we're in euphoria all the way to August, and then there was a whole natural cycle. And I believe we're somewhere here between uh, the point of maximum financial opportunity at this time. To be confirmed, I'll confirm it in one year from now. <laughs> um, so something else to be, to be interested by and to be aware of is that uh, the private equity market is very, very big. It has $2.5 trillion in uh, USD in value. But the problem with the private equity market is that the, the, the investments get locked up for seven to 10 years. They're hard to evaluate and the investor doesn't have much control. Now they want to liquidate them or know what happens in the meantime. Now Im imagine a world where all of these investments are actually crypto coins or crypto tokens. And they're of course regulated securities and they're of course trading on regulated securities exchange. Think New York Stock Exchange. Now you can see how this whole market will now be much more liquid. The valuations of the tokens that are there for the investments will be more in real time and will allow to be much more real time controls. We'll be able to have tens of thousands of people submit a decision or take a decision with very low cost um, in near real time. So, so we see where the market is now. I see somewhere on the horizon, maybe five years, 10 years from now, how this potential coin market can go in the direction of the private equity market by itself, maybe even other, other markets. And you can see the opportunity there. And this is why, of course, I'm interested and so on. Um, obviously, you're probably aware of this, but I'd like to, to mention it. Um, a website where you can see a lot of cryptocurrencies that are already being issued that are mostly trading on exchanges is coinmarketcap.com. They are usually ranked in um, market caps per coin. I made this first presentation a month ago, and then the previous one I had made in April to 2017. So I had my own numbers between April and June. In during that time, the whole market cap went from 27 to 335 billion. Now it's a bit higher. Um, and then the daily volume, that's very interesting, went from about 780 million to 15 billion. 
Now, there have been arguments that some of this $15 billion volume is actually wash trade, just to show volume, but not real volume. I'm pretty sure that some of it is true, um, but it's still some of it. Is, volume definitely increased. It, it cannot be 90% just wash trades. And most importantly, where before Bitcoin was 67% of the market, now Bitcoin is only about 38% of the market, roughly. The numbers keep changing every day, so I need to keep that in, in uh, mind. Now, a few other problems to keep in mind as you potentially look at buying tokens or evaluating ICOs. Transparency. Um, transparency is very limited. Um, typically done over the internet. You don't know who you're dealing with. You have some information, pictures, IDs, um, but it's very limited. In fact, you're relying on the legal system of the country where either the company is organized or where the, 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 the executive team lives. Because often they just do it offshore. Um, but practically, there's no real legal system because it's so decentralized and worldwide and on, on the blockchain where um, actions cannot even be rolled back. Right? Imagine this. Imagine somebody uh, says something fraudulent and you send them $10,000 in their bank account at Citibank. What's going to happen next? Well, you're going to be a lawsuit probably, assume you win, the judge is going to force Citibank to give you the money back. It's still there. In this case, same thing happens, fraudulent action, you send one Bitcoin to somebody and there's a problem, there's a lawsuit, you win, the judge instructs them to send your Bitcoin back. Well, short of getting the private key from whoever controls that account, Nobody and nothing can force them to send the Bitcoin back. And uh, I'd like to remind you that torture is frowned upon these days. So um, I, I, I really don't think, you have to keep in mind that once the transaction is done, it's irreversible. And hoping to get it back is difficult at best. Um, and keep, keep that in mind about your legal rights. Now, about how to invest, uh, you may have heard of uh, contracts like simple agreement for future token or simple agreement for future token or equity or smart contract. So these are very different. Simple agreement for future token or simple agreement for future token and equity, SAFT or SAFTI, are actual paper or in this case um, eco signs or electronic documents that one signs with the company. The very, very much the same way as you'd buy equity in a company or you'd buy something from somebody else. It's a, it's a purchase and sell contract. Um, you did purchase future tokens when going to be created. Now, the difference in the first one and the second one is that in the first one, you agree to buy future tokens whenever they're going to be created. In the second type of agreement, if the tokens never get created, you end up with equity in the company. So obviously, this uh, SAFT E agreement is in the favor of the purchaser, and most companies won't even offer them or mention them. So it's for you, the purchaser, to say, like, look, I want a SAFT E agreement. And then, as traditionally with paper contracts and so on, I strongly recommend that an attorney reviews it on your side. And the sophistication of this contract also tell you how well the company is prepared, how sophisticated and likely to succeed the company is. Now the difference with the smart contract is a smart contract is actually a piece of software. If you go here, you can see an idea of the, the smart contract. So Ethereum was the main, the, main, the, the first um, network to offer a smart contract. And what it is, it's a computer that runs in the same time on many, many different nodes. And nobody can actually falsify the output of the computer or control it or manipulate it or block it or prevent it from happening. Um, so it's like a distributed computer in the cloud. Like we're used to storage in the cloud. This is more like computing in the cloud. Of course, it's very expensive because imagine every computer in the network has to do the same calculations in the same time, in the same way. And there are ways that are being worked upon to improve that, to keep the safety and security of it without the cost, making it cheaper. But what it can actually do, it can actually execute scripts that use the same input and output. And those are typically referred to as smart contracts. Why smart? Because they, are, they can do many different things. Why contracts? Because nobody can really prevent them from executing. So here's an example of it. This is what a smart contract looks like. You note that it's very different than a token purchase agreement. They will say the parties, they would say the terms, it's a legal contract. 
this is like a computer software. So the way these are being used in token, in token purchases is that such a program is being created, then it's being launched on the network. And everybody can go and look what this contract does. And of course, this contract will receive payments, usually in the format at Ethereum, then we'll store it there, and whichever address sends the Ethereum will send tokens back. And this TP type of contract will also have uh, in there all kinds of rules on will all the tokens be av available right away, at which price, what are the timelines of the coin offering, when does it finish, can you create more of them, and so on. So this is pretty much what dictates an initial coin offering. I personally feel like this is the real innovation here. And this allows people to buy tokens with $1 or less. For example, in the Lampix uh, coin offering, the smallest purchaser was 30 US dollar cents. Um, this democratizes access to these tokens where nobody with $1 could buy a share in Facebook or Google or Twitter or any of these other large companies or Amazon when they were created. So um, the legal fees themselves alone and the cost of doing that was prevent, was, it wasn't even a matter of should we discuss the possibility of doing that. It was absolutely mechanically not possible. Um, just to manage also so many people as well, if you op had opened Google to everybody buying into the beginning of the company. So the coin offerings, the initial coin offerings and the smart contracts make it mechanically feasible and possible, which opens the door to all kinds of possibilities. And this is why I personally like relying on them. I think it shows that it's a real coin offering. It's not a paper coin offering. We understand the strength of the blockchain ecosystem and they use it. But also as the purchaser, you now rely on a computer software, whatever that's worth, versus on the, the fact that whoever you sign the paper contract with is going to do what the paper contract says they, should, they are going to do. And then if they don't, you have to enforce it with attorneys and lawsuits and whatnot. Um, typically, a smart contract in ICO will have at least four or five such parameters that you have to look at. The token functionality, when and how can the token be bought and sold. Now, this typically is not written in the initial coin offering contract when the tokens are being sold. It's written in the white paper, which is like an offering doc. But uh, these, you know, it should be very clear when you when you actually uh, do the look at purchasing the coin, the coin, what the coins are being used for, and later on, the company will probably implement a smart contract implementing those functions as described there. Of course, the token price, the the token offering schedule, typically I recommend for be for a lockup period, both the the management of the company. Maybe the purchasers, the company itself, have a lockup period for everybody's uh, interest to be aligned. And then, of course, token liquidity. Uh, the entire point of this ecosystem, as we talked about private equity as well, is to, to see the token community getting putting a value on this community and the size and active. It's going to also push the company to deliver and, and really make the community work because that's the token liquidity is going to be higher and also affect the token price as well. So uh, here's an example of um, different parameters to look at as well. We just talked about the general categories. Here's actual examples. Um, for example, when we did the first blood ICO, the uh, sale was according to the following schedule in the lower right corner. For the first hour, you could get 170 first blood tokens for one Ethereum. Then for the following week, 150 for one, 133 to one, 117 and 100 to one. This is like example, actual ICO token price change during the offering. The idea behind this price going up is um, that people who put in early buy the first tokens take more risk and the later you buy, the, 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 the lower the risk for you. Um, I also looked about what the company is going to do with it. So you want to look at the, the use case. And this particular case for First Blood, it was around development, um, finding the releases and the operations. And then in general, the credibility of the project, um, you want to look at what they're going to do with the, with the actual coins, the expertise of the team, the track record of the team, the schedule, if it's real, real, realistic. If they plan to build everything in three months and everybody else in the industry is planning to build it in three years, Something is not quite right there. Marketing, 
It's important that the community gets built and has visibility and so on. And of course, the valuation. If they're trying to build, to, run, to, to, raise, to raise, to 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 sell for thirty million dollars worth of tokens, when what, all they need to create a small software is three hundred thousand, once again, red flag. Something is a is a problem there. So I mentioned a lot this uh, coin offering done by First Blood. I was part of the team there. Uh, what they did is they built a platform to allow players to challenge each other in online games. And by games, I mean League of Legends, uh, Counter-Strike, stuff like that. And the existing solutions were all centralized, which means that if I actually want to play a game against my best friend, Ryan, um, and I say, look, Ryan, if I win, I get a Bitcoin. If you win, you get a Bitcoin, and we need to put two Bitcoins together. We go through an escrow, and of course I trust Ryan, everything will be fine, we don't have to go through an escrow. But if some random person of the internet and I win, then they're going to claim that I cheated. And there's a cost of escrow and so on. So this is the idea about moderating disputes and also decentralized for cheaper cost. And at the end of the day, the real edge of the business is cheaper cost. So this esports space is very big. League of Legends, Dota 2, Counter-Strike are uh, big games in the space. It's a very, very big market. It took, to give you an idea, if you compare, 112 million people watch the Super Bowl, 27 million people watch the League of Legends World Final, which is more than golf, more than NBA Finals, more than World Series, more than the Stanley Cup Finals, and so on. And then, Mass is more popular, but Dota 2, the other game, is also very, very popular. And I didn't put here Counter-Strike and other things, but it's a big market, it's growing, it's really, really impressive. And it's real, a real market. There are professional athletes. For actual normal sport in the U.S., the average median pay for the sport athlete is 44,000 and about 13,000 jobs. For the, av for the average online esports athlete, it's around 75,000 a year. There's less good data, but uh, you know, even higher. And some of them do make more than a million dollars per year playing League of Legends and Dota 2 and Counter Strike. So. This is what the token offering looked like back then. This was done in September of 2016, soon to be two years. Uh, first, raised 465,000 Ether. Back then, the Ether was around $10. $10. Um, it was worth about 20 million you know, last year, about a year ago. Now it's worth even more. Of course, they sold much, much of it. At Emittent, they raised 5.5 million, to give an, an idea. They took them three months of marketing to promote <clears throat> the offering and then they executed it. So once again, there is this much of Ether, but the, back then it was worth this much. Uh, and then they offered it on two exchanges after it. And the whole offering, the whole ICO sold out in 10 seconds. Why? Because it was one of the first ones and there was no many competition because they raised a reasonable amount of money because they had a valid project with a real functionality and real blockchain and greater scarcity as well. But there was a key. Had they tried to raise 300 million, they probably would not have even raised five and a half. Think about it. Here's another token offering that I've done. This was our CEO and co-founder of it. This is our website, pixtoken.co. So the idea is to crowdsource data for, to train computer vision and machine learning. So it's a much bigger use case than one thinks. Uh, Self-driving cars, augmented reality, and, and so on. We sold in 10 days and we raised 41,000 Ethereum. Um, and, and, and this is another example. Now, in terms of risk, I showed you two particular ICOs. Something that you really need to be aware of is the risk of fraud. Um, it's less likely for people who meet face-to-face -face or in person or who exchange fiat, but everything's done over the internet, people you never met, you're never going to meet, to so exchange cryptocurrencies has a fairly hard, high chance of fraud from and I've, I, I've seen token offerings where everything was fake. The team pictures were from stock. They did not exist, have no LinkedIn profiles, they have no careers, nobody knew them, and, and so on. So be careful at that level of fraud, all the way to uh, misleading where they say they need $30 million, but honestly, they don't need $30 million. So why they need so much money, that's kind of a, a big problem. Then traditional risk in all early stage investments in companies are execution risks, which of course the top one being team dis dispute. This happens one company out of two where the founders get in a fight. Product, nobody wants it, product doesn't work, there's no market for it. So hence the market product fit. That's why having revenue 
usually means you have a working product and you have a market product fit. And then market risk, of course. Uh, we think that blockchain is going to give, give, give these companies an edge and they're going to be impressive, but there's no guarantee there. And of course, security. So we haven't talked much about security so far, but uh, here's an exchange, Gatecoin. It's an exchange I, I, I'm, I'm the board of advisors on, um, so I'm very familiar with the exchange. Uh, they first started by doing Bitcoin only, then they started doing other coins and even promoting uh, coin offerings. But the biggest problem they had was a security breach. In May of 2016, somehow, somebody stole from them 185,000 Ether and 250 Bitcoin. At that point, it was worth $2.1 million. Now it's worth significantly more from an attack on hot wallets. Uh, there have been many, many other heists. Uh, at the time, um, you know, the, of the highest, the biggest ones were about 500 million. But now, the 100,000 bitcoins lost from Mount Gox are worth more like 8 billion, or order of magnitude. To give you an idea what this is. So, the problem with this is that in the crypto space, um, we all talk about decentralization and having control. But in a space where all the money is in the banks, the banks are the ones worrying about the security of the funds, right? With the vaults, security officers, and they have people full-time worrying just on that, just about that. Now, if we put our money in exchanges, of course, the exchanges are trying, but as you can see, it's risky, like pretty much a bank heist. But if you hold your cryptocurrencies in your personal wallet at home, you have the same risk as holding a million dollars in cash under your bed in your mattress. So please be careful about that, and please read more about security of fund and have top say security for your wallets. Um, to f to f I'm close to finishing now. Um, just to go over the red flags and risk one more time. A few things that to me say, no, no, I'm not investing in this, usually, unless there's some other um, reason that it makes it exceptional. So first one is nothing is built. It's just an idea. That's usually a red flag to me. I, I, there is so many of them and Unless it's from an entrepreneur who's two or three times already built something and sold it, and there are some very large credible investors behind, I don't touch that. Is there a real need for blockchain? That's another big red flag. Uh, I can try to sell hot dogs on blockchain. How would that change life at all? No, not, it won't really help me because I have to physically deliver the hot dogs to the people, so you have to meet the clients face to face. So why would I even bother with internet money? Maybe it makes sense to sell images of the, on the internet because I'm not going to send wires or uh, cash or checks for that, but not, not, not hot dogs. Also, the token functionality. Some idea, is there a real need for its own token? Then about the team, and this is much closer to traditional investment. Does the team have either experience, credibility? And it's fine if they don't have experience. However, credibility is very important very, very important, how they listen, how they learn, how are they likely to um, solve problems because the problems and issues will happen. Are they able to get over those? Also, schedule. Not respecting the self-imposed rules in a coin offering to me is a big, big red flag that I have a problem with. Um, also, the type of marketing and the amount of marketing they're doing. Successful ICOs don't sell, hey, um, is it 75% discount token, buy. That's not, that's not a reason to buy a token. In fact, it's a reason to run away from the token. What, what you want to see is we have invented a new blockchain protocol technology that allows to do things 10 times faster and cheaper, and here it is working, and you can practice, you can try it, and you can see these other experts who also vouch for it. You can download it from your computer, you can try it yourself, and, and then you know, we only offer a million dollars worth of tokens for sale, and that's it. That you want to buy in. Um, a token hard cap, soft cap, what I just said, if people raise 100 million to do nothing, a billion, two billions, we've seen crazy numbers out there that makes absolutely no sense. Same thing with the proceeds. What I'm gonna do with them, is it clear, is it organized, do you have a budget? Uh, does it all make sense? Uh, also, how aligned are the team incentives? If the team is able to sell 100% of the proceeds of the token, in one hour, and no matter how the success, of the, the success of the project, you don't want it. So the biggest red flag, and some of these sub red flags I think hint towards that, is, is the team looking to make money on the token offering 
or is the team actually looking to make money on the company, on the product they're trying to build, the feature, the service, whatever they're building, the protocol? If it smells like they're trying to make money on the, on the, on the actual offering, run away. If it smells like they're actually trying to build something valuable with the process of the token offering, that becomes interesting. So in conclusion, and I think this is the one before the last, um, you can find new token uh, offerings on what's called ICO calendars. Google them, there's lots of them out there. I strongly believe that the best token offerings are not advertised. Go into forums, go to in the space, see what, who's think of doing one, follow them for a few months, a year, watch them build what they're doing, watch them prepare for it, then probably, probably go, in, go into and to try to work with them or participate in the token offering. You can rely on credible third parties. There are some experienced investors out there who invest in companies. If they put money in, verify that they did. It's not a false claim. It's not fraud. And if it's verified and them independently confirm it on their side via press release or something on their site or something like that, then, then it's worth paying attention. Um, and then this is no different than investing as a VC in early stage companies. Um, but it's also not the same as investing in equity in early stage companies. So, so keep, keep that in mind, very important. And last but not least, all crypto assets and tokens are very correlated. So you're not diversifying out of Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, by buying coin offerings in ICOs. I mentioned ICO calendars. Here's a famous one, tokenmarket.net. This video again, which really explains how blockchain works and has an understanding, I really, really recommend. And you can see here, Smart contracts are also referred to as distributed apps or dApps. Here's a, a list of different dApps that exist to give an idea how things are going in the ecosystem. And this was my last slide. So I hope you found this interesting. Once again, my email is gapopescu at gmail.com. You see it down here. And I'll be now open for questions. Uh, typically, there is a 60 seconds delay during which um, you can, I, 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 during which I, 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 I need to wait to see the questions you write. So I'll be quiet for about a minute now and then hope you have some questions and then I'll answer the questions as they arrive. There have been no, no questions yet. As I mentioned there is a delay typically in the um, web webinar broadcast and the uh, question asking. Um, by the way, while we're waiting, I want to mention that this webinar is actually recorded so you can also watch it later or share with other people. Uh, good question, which ICO has surprised you the most? Uh, in good or in bad? That's a very good question. I personally, you know, the biggest red flag I mentioned is, is somebody looking to make money on the ICO is actually really somebody trying to build something valuable. EOS to me is a interesting case where the way it was structured to me smell more like they're trying to make money on the ICO than actually build something. Ethereum build what they build with a few million dollars. You don't need much more money to build a competitor to, to Ethereum. Why did they build like that? So that surprised me. Another one that surprised me uh, was the uh, Telegram ICO, a lot of money, unclear why. So all of these really big numbers, like a moment when a company raised more than 10, 20, 30 million dollars, like more than 30, I, why do they need that much money? What are they going to do? Um, one developer, rule of thumb, one developer is $100,000 per year. So with 10 million, you have 10 developer, uh, sorry, 10 million, you have 100 developer years, 10 developers for 10 years. Why do you need $100 million? What are you going to do with it? So those surprised me. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen any good ICOs that did not raise money. So typically, the really good ones do raise money. So I'm surprised by that still. I expect the sooner or later, I will see some really good ones who don't raise the money. It's interesting too. Uh, now, some ICOs do justify the amount of capital they end up with. Uh, for example, the, one, the, way you, the coin used to be called Basecoin. Now, they need the capital to make the token stable. So it's capital intensive. It's a capital market kind of thing. So that one, they, they raised hundreds of millions. Those are useful and they're needed and it makes sense. And as you can see, also the investors in Basecoin were really, really good. Uh, another example that surprised me was Tezos, uh, 232 million. 
worth quite a lot more at some point, now back to around 3 or 400 million. Also, you know, they need they need 10 developers for two or three years. They don't need all their money. So leads to problems, as you can see. I'm being asked, what do I think about cryptocurrency-based loyalty programs? Um, I think it's interesting. I've seen quite a few projects around that. I think uh, blockchain adds a lot of value and a lot of um, advantages to these, to these programs. Um, they are cheaper from the company, they are cheaper to maintain and run, they are transparent. Um, I haven't seen uh, one program that really works well, yet I've seen a lot of people jumping on this bandwagon and trying to leverage the keyword blockchain to go to, to attract attention, and those I frown upon. Um, I, I personally, uh, all these companies who are trying to push their stock, their public are trying to push a stock by announcing some blockchain project, that's smoke and mirrors. Um, they typically, typical companies who are mature, um, they, they, they having hard time, they'll have hard time cannibalizing their own business model to offer uh, um, loyalty program based on blockchain if they have something else in place already, plus their typical target clients who are, let's say, the average American family probably won't understand that. So I think there's something there, but I don't think it's necessarily for using companies who already established to displace existing programs. I think it's something new. Um, so about uh, another com next comp question I have is if a company wants to raise a hundred million dollar from an ICO to buy capital equipment like aircraft, is it a good use of ICO rates? So the question, the answer is most, it's, it's long. First one is what do they offer for the tokens? What is the token functionality? If the token functionality is to own equity in the aircraft, now we're talking about a security token and what we're actually talking about is a company who's emitting equity to buy aircraft uh, equipment. That's a standard use of equity. It makes sense. So you have to value the actual um, uh, credibility of the company, but it's very standard. Um, now, you have to make sure that as a token, you also have the, at least the same rights as an equity holder, if not better rights and you, they take advantage of the, the token uh, functionality where they can actually distribute cash flow, let's say in real time. As soon as an aircraft is booked, you immediately get your share of the fees there. You need to make sure that you get, you know, how the mechanism, how do you get paid? You get paid those fees in their own tokens, you get paid those fees in Bitcoin, Ethereum, in US dollars. Um, so it's not ridiculous. It's something I think will be more and more of them. I think the risk to reward when you use tokens to buy these actual physical assets have real value uh, is, is very good and decent. Um, so you need to really look, to look deeper. I think it's an interesting use case and one we should be studied more. I'm being asked the next question, what do I think about airdrop and bounty of the ICO? So uh, just so to explain to everybody, airdrop means instead of you purchasing a token, the tokens are being given away for free. So you just wait, and it's like somebody going by with a truck and throwing tokens to everybody who's in the public. Um, I think it's interesting. I think that airdrop is a way to build a community without actually looking like trying to make money from that. Um, just I've heard uh, on Unconfirmed Podcast yesterday or the day, after, the day before that even if you airdrop a token, if the token is a security, imagine somebody go driving around New York and throwing IBM shares out the truck, you're still giving away say, securities and has to follow the security law. So airdrop doesn't prevent security laws. On the other side, uh, it does allow a company to look like they want to build a community without trying to get rich in the process uh, and then trying to leverage the community from that. The drawback of airdrops is that if you get something for free, <laughs> typically don't use it, you think it has no value, so to do a proper airdrop, I think you need to target the right community, do the right type of airdrop, and to make sure that the tokens are really valuable and they can be redeemed right away and used right away for something interesting and useful. Uh, now, what's a bounty for ICO? What do you think about bounties for ICOs? A bounty is typically somebody who is paid in tokens for doing work promoting the ICO or translating it or doing something for the ICO. So I, I think it's actually from the receiver, it's, uh, says that the receiver believes in the ICO, 
in the new, new tokens. So it's good uh, if you're willing to work for tokens that, that are you know, that are being will be worth something in the future. Uh, then I think it's it's good for the ICOs. Uh, for the person who creates the ICO, finding the more people who can help you promote your project, assuming it's good and valuable and so on, the better it is. So I think bounties are all all good. Let's make sure you find the right people to really promote the bounties. You track the results from your bounty uh, promoters, and they get paid based on based on uh, re results. Next question. Do you think wellness-based concepts like Fitcoin or Sweatcoin will ever be successful? Have you they shown they can influence wellness fitness? So to me, these are nothing other than loyalty or a gamification. And yes, I think that's interesting. I also think I'm, I like games. I know, as most people, uh, I get like being re re rewarded. Will this work? Well I, well, I like the concept. I'm not sure that any particular coin will do better than the others. Um, I think what will validate it is traction because, you know, I'm, I go to the gym, I'm a member of Equinox. If Equinox gave me 10 whatever coins every single time I run half an hour on the treadmill, it would probably motivate me. And if some of these companies can manage to get enough um, gyms to, to sign up and to participate to get physical mass, I think there will be something there. So the question is which one will do well, probably the one with the biggest mass, the faster. Look at Facebook. Um, it, it's not that hard to create a social network. What's hard is to create people, people to participate and to build enough size. And so I think the answer to this is make sure that you have the right company, the right concept, the right size, and you're put, putting, you're buying the one that's going to be hopefully the grow the fastest with the most amount of followers, the the the, the fastest. My two cents. And by the way, make your do your own diligence. These are all the questions I got so far. Um, happy to answer some more if you guys have. We're also running a bit of out of time. We're talking about 52 minutes. So I hope you found this useful. Uh, feel free to reach out by email if you want. Um, I'm also on Telegram, GA Popescu. And uh, I, I hope to run into you in one of the local New York meetups or events or conferences or anything else uh, around. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Goodbye.